All right. Well, good morning, church. It is great to see you guys out today. I'm glad that you're here with us. We are in part three of this uh, four-part series that we've been calling Jesus Over All. And this series is, is diving into it, what I would consider to be a critically important topic, the topic of the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus has authority and power over all things, the fact that Jesus is the one who um, all worthy, or is worthy of all worship and is worthy of all praise, not just because of what he has done, but because of who he is. And so as we talk about the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, I hope that we are soaking all of this in, that he is supreme in all spheres. Um, we looked, as we look around us, uh, politically, culturally, societally, we see uh, what is becoming just, I would just call it a mess. The world is becoming more and more removed from a biblical worldview. And as we get further away from a biblical worldview, we see a direct correlation to a decline in morality. We see a correlation to a decline in the strength of the family, even a decline in a sense of things like work ethic, honesty, uh, just overall character. As you get away from biblical truths, you see just a failure of society as a whole. Now, Jesus' purpose in being authoritative and supreme over all things isn't just to create a good moral society. The purpose of Jesus' supremacy over all things is to create a society that will bring honor to God by trusting in God, placing faith in Him, and living according to His will and according to His way. But we see that in the, when there is a rejection of those truths that are transformative, we see that that society changes in a way that is detrimental to all people. And if I am being just really honest with you from a perspective of what's going on in our society and world today, um, the world that this generation is inheriting in the next, okay, it is not a pretty place. Okay? I think about my own kids and my own future grandkids about what it is that they are going to be inheriting as far as a worldview, as far as what is the predominant culture going to look like. And I, and I think the handwriting is on the wall. I mean, we see what is, is happening and what is going, and the only thing that can change that is Jesus Christ. Okay? Change of politics, a changing of, uh, of leaders, that, that does not change what's happening in the heart of man. That does not change what is happening internally. The only thing that can change the heart, which will affect the way that, that we think and the way that things uh, are done, is Jesus Christ himself. And so this topic of the supremacy of Jesus Christ, I think, is critically, critically important because our world is in desperate need of Jesus. The only way it's going to see Jesus, though, is by seeing him being lived out first in our lives of those who are truly dedicated to follow him, the lives of Christians. Guys, that's where it's going to start. They have to see a difference. They have to see that the world in which they live in can be different than the way that they are seeing it at the moment. Christians now, more than ever, need to stand up and be counted. They need to stand up and be noticed, not in an obnoxious or an antagonistic way, but in a way that invites people to see that through Jesus, that, that there really is another way to live. Ultimately, we understand that it is a better way to live. It's a way that honors God, but a way that the benefit is also brings what is best to the individual, that is best for families, that is best for a city, that is best for a society, and that is best for a nation. And so hopefully we, we are taking all of this in, that we are not just content to come to church and to, to go home uh, on a Sunday afternoon and say, wow, that was good music, that was a great message, that was this, and then just live the same way. Guys, we have to live differently in the world, okay? And the world needs to see that change in us because that, that's where it's going to start. They're going to start by saying that there is something different about that person, about that family, about that church, about that city, okay? And we have to affect that change, but it only happens when we are 100% dedicated to the supremacy of Jesus Christ, that God, it is your will, your way in my life. Whatever it is that you want to do with me, I will follow you, okay? And that's what God desires for us. Guys, if we can't see how desperately our world needs Jesus, we must be blind, right? We're blind. If we can't see how desperately our world needs Jesus today, you're not looking because our world needs Christ. Open your Bibles, your Bible apps with me this morning. We're going to be in both the Old and New Testament. I'm going to start in the Old Testament this morning, in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. And in just a minute, we're going to be reading from chapter 32. Now, let me just mention briefly what we've looked at in the first half of this series. 
For the last two weeks, we've seen that the Bible declares Jesus as Lord of creation and Lord over all creation, over all the, the natural world. And that's what we've talked about as the foundation. That's where really you've got to begin. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning, God created. And we see that Jesus was that agent of creation. He was the Word. And so the Bible gives us in explicit detail, Old and New Testament, that in the beginning, God was the creator. And the creator God was Jesus. We saw that he was the agent of all that we, the agent of creation, the agent uh, bringing into existence all that we see and even that which we do not. Colossians 1.16 also tells us that all things were created through him, but not just through him, they were created for him. It was created for the honor and the glory of God. It was created for Christ himself. John chapter 1 also gives us more details about Jesus' relationship to the time of creation. But then as we look at the time when Jesus was alive on this earth, we see that he showed power and ability to control that which no man could control, that being nature itself. It was that display of power that left the disciples in awe of him. Remember what they said when they saw Jesus controlling the wind and the waves? He says, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? They were left in awe because they knew they had no power over anything of the natural world. But this Jesus, this Jesus controlled everything. And so they were in awe of his power. And Jesus would continue to show his authority over the created world in multiple miracles. Many miracles were interacted with the natural world, showing his complete supremacy over all things. And that is the Jesus that we serve, supreme over all the created world. But this morning, as we look once again at Jesus, we're going to see that Jesus is not only Lord of the created world, but he is also Lord over all of mankind. He is Lord over you, me, over all of mankind. Now, as we talked about in our first message of this series, the Apostle John made it clear that Jesus is God. John said, in the beginning was the Word, which we later read as Jesus. He says, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he doesn't mince words. He doesn't try and, and confuse things. He says, Jesus was God in the flesh. And it doesn't get much clearer than that. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And so as we look at the Old Testament and we see the reference to the Lord, which would be God the Father, I don't think we're doing a disservice to the truth of the Scripture to bring this into the context of Jesus' supremacy over all things, especially since we'll be looking at the New Testament as well and seeing the exact same principle being ascribed to Jesus. Okay? But I don't want us to mix up the character, that's in, the, the personhood that's involved here. As we look in the Old Testament, we are referencing God, but in the sense of God the Father. And then as we turn to the New Testament, we're going to be referencing God, but in the terms of God the Son, God, the Lord, God in the form of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, but we're going to see the supremacy of God, okay, the Trinity as a whole in both the Old and New Testament. I think that's, that's important that we're going to see that this principle is continuous through all of humanity, that God is is Lord, that Jesus is Lord over all mankind, past, present, and future. And so we're going to see how he interacts, how God interacts with mankind historically, and then we're going to reflect upon what that means for us today. What do we do with this information from a practical sense, all right? So let's start in that Old Testament book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 32, and we're going to read a couple of verses, then we'll skip down, and we'll read a little bit more uh, that, that gives us a, a fuller context, and I'll kind of explain what's happening in between. So Jeremiah 32, starting in verse 26, the Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying... And so what we've got is God is speaking to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is recording the message that God has for his people, okay? So the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Okay. And so I think what's happening here is pretty clear. Again, God's speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is recording the words of God. And what God says is that he is the Lord. Okay. He is the master. He is the ruler. He is the one who is supreme. Okay. That is our understanding that you're going to have in that context with Lord. He is the Lord. He is Jehovah, and that he is the God of all flesh. Okay? The God of all flesh. In other words, he is God, he is Lord over all mankind. Okay? I don't think that that's difficult to understand. It just comes out and says it. He is God over all of humanity. Okay? And that's an incredibly important statement. Because what we see is that he is not only God over those who follow after him, 
but he is God over even those who reject him or fight against him. You think about what I just said. God is not only God over those who choose to follow after him, but he is also God over those who reject him or fight against him. Okay, let that just kind of soak for a minute. Because sometimes we don't think about that, right? We talk about children of God. We talk about being a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And so we're putting ourselves in this category. We are, we are gods, okay? Not that we are the God, but we are gods, God possessive of us, right? But the Bible says that he is God over all mankind. Now, what does that mean? Okay? Does that mean since God says he's the God of all flesh that all people will one day be in heaven? Is this contributing itself to what you might term uh, universalism? Is that what this passage of Scripture is saying? Does that support universalism, that all people are going to be in heaven when they die? No, not at all. The statement that God is the God of all flesh means that all people are subject to God's authority. You hear that? All people are subject to God's authority, and there is no one who falls outside of that authority. All people are subject to God. All mankind answers to God, whether or not they acknowledge it. Okay? All mankind will answer to God. Let that one sink in as well. Whether or not a person chooses to acknowledge the fact that they are going to answer to this creator God, the one that we have already shown to be all-powerful, the one who is over all of the natural and created world, we too are created, so he is over us also, they will answer to that God. Okay? Make sure that you understand the implications of this statement. Because even the most devout atheist who cries out that there is no God will one day have to answer to the God that he says he does not believe in. Okay? One day he will answer to the God he says does not exist. Because God is the God of all flesh. And that's what we're dealing with here. It doesn't say that God is the God that will save everyone despite their own desire and will. It says that he is supreme, that he is authoritative over all people, all of mankind. We're going to come back to this truth in just a little bit concerning those who will choose not to trust in the Lord, those who will choose not to trust in Jesus. Okay, we're going to look at that in the New Testament as well, especially in Philippians uh, chapter 2. But I just want to kind of leave you with that thought as we continue thinking about God being God over all of mankind, God over all of humanity. God says, is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? Now, that's a rhetorical question, one of the questions that we don't have to answer, because what God is saying is that there isn't anything too hard for him. But the answer is, should be obvious to us, well, no, you're God. We, you've, you've created all things. Everything that we can see and taste and touch and smell and feel, all of the things that we, can, that we can experience with our senses and the things even that we can't, God, they're created by you. So there's nothing that is too hard for you. And with that context, he's then going to go on and tell Jeremiah a very hard and prophetic truth in verses 28 through 36. Because remember, this is God speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah is recording the words of God, and God is going to say something that is going to be hard to hear, or at least especially hard for the recipients of Jeremiah's writings and Jeremiah's teachings or his preachings. Because he's going to tell Jeremiah that because of sin, because of rebellion of the people, he is going to allow the city of Jerusalem to be destroyed. He's going to allow this, this holy city, the city of Jerusalem, to be taken over by the Babylonians, the people referred to here as the Chaldeans. King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he's going to burn the city. He's going to take captive the people. They'll go into what we historically refer to as the Babylonian captivity. And God is going to allow that because of the sin and the rebellion of his people. Okay? And God is going to do this so that the nation of Israel will eventually return to him in faith. Okay? Because remember, God knows the past. He knows the present. He also knows the future. And he is the Lord of all mankind. And so he tells Jeremiah, this is going to happen. And he doesn't reveal it in any uncertain terms. He's talking about how angry he is. He's talking about his displeasure with the way that Israel behaved itself as far as turning away from him and turning to other false gods and their worship and them taking the temple and turning it into a place of, of, of not a place of worship, but a place of sacrilege and a place that is dishonoring to him. 
and it, and it caused him to, to, uh, to well up with, um, I get, the best term is probably going to be anger. And we're going to see that that is actually one of the responses that God has toward this. Why is he angry? He's angry because of their actions and because of their destructive nature and what the results are going to be. He says, but I am going to allow them to be uh, taken. I'm going to allow the city to be destroyed, um, to be burned, and the Babylonians to be uh, over the nation of Israel. He knew what was going to be necessary. And that's the thing you're going to see over and over in the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament. God knows what is necessary for the hearts of, of any person or the hearts of any people to turn back to him. And he did what was necessary to get their attention to accomplish his will for the nation of Israel. Okay? And God does that. He does whatever is necessary with whoever he needs to to accomplish his will because he is the God over all mankind. He has authority over everything. But I want us to focus in on this morning from this passage is what it is that God is going to do after this. He says what's going to happen. He is prophetic in talking about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. But I want us to see what it is that God is going to do after this and why. Okay? What is, how is God going to interact with his people after this comes to pass? So look at Jeremiah 32. Skip down to 37. Remember, prophetic, and again, we're going even further into the future, that after the destruction of Jerusalem, after the captivity, this is what I'm going to do. God's speaking to Jeremiah. He says, Behold, I will gather them out of all countries where I have driven them in my anger, in my fury, and in great wrath. Okay, that's God speaking. He says, I have anger, fury, and great wrath. I will bring them back to this place, talking about Jerusalem, and I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people, I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good, but I will put my fear and my reverence in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. Yes, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart, with all my soul. This is God. Man, do you hear the words of love? Okay. The first words, we're going to talk about those first words in verse 37. We see God's anger, his fury, and his wrath. Right? Something that you don't hear about a lot in today's culture, right? We don't want to talk about God's fury, his wrath, and his anger, that God is wrathful against sin and the destructiveness of, of people that practice sin. But his own people were doing it. So God says, I am angry. I am wrathful. I have fury. Guys, this is a part of God's character that we dare not miss, but it's contrasted by his love, right? We dare not miss that God is angered, infuriated by what happens when people willfully choose to sin. Do we understand that? If you willfully choose to sin, God is angered. Why? Why? Why was God angry, furious, wrathful? He was angry at the sin of his children. He was angry at the destruction that the sin brought. And unfortunately, it was a pattern that kept repeating itself, isn't it? Something that kept happening with the nation of Israel. We talked a lot about that in our previous study of the book of Judges. It kept repeating itself. God was angry, furious, and wrathful. But again, before we come down too hard on just the nation of Israel, let's remember that we are people just like they are that we are prone to the same patterns of sin. We are prone to the same types of responses and thus prone to the same, same, same type of response from God, his anger, okay? his fury over sin. Guys, God's view of sin hasn't changed. He didn't just because now we have Jesus that's come on the scene in the New Testament, now it's only love. Yes, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, but God still displays and shows and experiences anger, anger towards the sin of his children. Okay? He still gets angry when we sin, and because he knows the damage that's being done to us and to others as a result of our sin, he doesn't just sit back idly and say, oh, boys will be boys, okay, that people are going to be people, they're just going to do that. No, God responds. Okay? So if you're a Christian, when you sin, guys, it angers the Lord. Hear me, sin angers God. It angers him. 
But here's the deal. If you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, if you're truly what Jesus said is born again, if you're truly a child of God, if you're a Christian, yes, God is angry with you when you sin. He's angry when I sin. But the difference is it is not a condemning anger. If you are born again by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you have placed your faith in Jesus, when you sin, God is angry at you, but he is not angry with a condemnation. The Bible tells us that on the cross, Jesus took upon himself the wrath of God. Okay? He took upon himself the wrath of God the Father, God the Father for sin. That's why Paul can write in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus has already took all of the wrath and the anger of the condemning sin upon himself. And he has forgiven mankind. If anyone will place their faith and trust in Jesus, there is no condemnation for that individual. Because Jesus took all of that upon the cross. Okay? It's actually the same functional concept that we have here in Jeremiah 32. God is disciplining and correcting his children, okay? but he is not condemning them. God can and he still will be angry, displeased with me, displeased with you if you choose to disobey him and you choose to sin. He will be grieved toward his children in this disciplinary sense when they sin, but it is not condemnation. The book of Hebrews talks about, about how God relates to his children, okay? about punishment, correction, that those he loves, he chastises, he punishes, he brings them back to a course where they're going to do what's right because he knows what is best for us. And he doesn't punish out of hatred and out of animosity. Okay? He brings punishment into our life to course correct so that we don't experience ever worse effects of sin. Because that's, that's the same thing a parent does, right? If a child disobeys and they, they display a stubborn spirit of disobedience, and things that are going to be harmful to them, right? What is the loving thing to do for a parent? Is it just to let them go and say, oh, kids are going to be kids. You just, just let them do whatever they want to. Or is there going to be consequences? Is there going to be a level of punishment? Is there something that has to take place to change their course to where they can do what is right and, do what, and, and experience what is best for them? Guys, that's good parenting to say, no, you, there are consequences for actions. And that's what God is saying. He says, there are consequences for your actions. He says, but I still love you. Okay. I will discipline my children, but he says, I'm also going to bring them back home. Okay. That's what he says in verse 37. He says, yeah, I'm angry. He says, but I'm going to bring them back to this place. He says, and I'm going to cause them to dwell safely. He says, I'm going to shelter them. He says, they shall be my people. I'll be their God. Verse 41, he says, I will rejoice over them to do them good. I will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart, with all my soul. And so while God's anger, his fury, and his wrath are real, it's always going to be directed towards sin. It's going to be directed towards sinful action. It's going to be directed towards disobedience, that which is harmful to us. God doesn't want us destroyed. He wants that which is destroying us to be destroyed. That makes sense? Okay. He does not want to harm us. He wants to destroy and get rid of that which is harming us. And so he is angry at sin, but he loves his creation. That's why Jesus came into this world, because he loves mankind. Ultimately, everything that God does is dictated by his love for his people, and really his love for all of mankind. Everything that God does is dictated by his love for humanity. Now, we hit that big barrier because humanity can choose to do some pretty atrocious things. Because of sin, we have the ability to choose. And sometimes the horrendous acts and the things that are done by one man to another or groups of people can be just, I mean, just abhorrent, despicable. But it's all sin. Okay? But in the end, the Bible describes God as a just God. Okay? Sin does not go unpunished. We may not see it on this side of eternity. We may not see the direct correlation, but God knows, God sees, and God acts. God is a God that is dictated by his love. But sometimes his anger, his fury, and his wrath has to be directed at disobedience and sin. That's God. 
I want to change gears for just a second. We'll go into the New Testament. When the Bible says that the Lord is over all mankind, we see that that means everybody. You, me, past, present, future people. God's ultimate desire is for people to trust in him. God's ultimate desire is for people to follow after him. But in order to do that, God has to show his power and his supremacy over all things. How does the New Testament describe God's relationship to mankind from this sense of, of his authority or his supremacy? Let's start in the book of Romans. I want us to look at chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 14 through 18. Romans chapter 9. And remember, we're talking about God's relationship to humanity with a special emphasis upon God's supremacy, the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 14. The Bible says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is there anything unjust, unfair? Is there anything unrighteous with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not in him who wills nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Okay. Okay. There we go. (laughs) All right, so I hope that what we're getting here, I hope we're understanding what was said, Okay. Uh, I love technology until technology doesn't work right, right? Isn't that, I mean, that's just the way it is. <laughs> technology is great until it doesn't work right. God is, is showing his relationship to mankind in this passage. As the Apostle Paul pins these words uh, to, to the Roman believers. He's asking, he says, is there anything that is unjust, that is unrighteous with God? And his, his declarative statement is certainly not. God is fair, he's righteous, he is just. He says, but... Never forget that he is supreme over all mankind, saying that I'm going to have mercy on who I'll have mercy. I'll have compassion on whoever I'll have compassion. He says it's God. He says it's all of God. It is God's decision, his will. It is his supremacy in all things. And then he uses the example of Pharaoh about mercy and about supremacy over all of these things. Earlier, when we were looking in the Old Testament, we saw that God is described as being the God of all flesh. So we saw in Jeremiah chapter 32, and that's his desire to do good to man, his, the, to desire, his desire to do good to his children, even when he has to discipline those who are his. But another aspect of God's supremacy over man is that he can and that he will do that which he pleases with us, that God can do whatever he wants with us, okay? Because after, just like the rest of the created world, we are created things, After all, we are created, just like the rest of this world. God created Adam from the dust of the ground. He created Eve from Adam himself. We are descendants from Adam and Eve. And therefore, again, we are subject to God's authority as the Lord is sovereign over his creation. And that's what we've seen for the last two weeks. Jesus' authority over creation of which we are a part of. But when we come here to Romans chapter 9, we see that Paul is describing for us how it is God's prerogative to do with each person that which he so chooses. And on top of that, Paul is writing, he says, that's not wrong. He says, is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. He says, this is fair. Okay, this is the right thing. God's supremacy, his sovereignty, his superiority over all things, even mankind, over every person. He says, that is right and fair and just because he is God. Guys, we talked a lot about this in our series in the book of Judges, that if we don't have a, 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 a comfortable relationship with God's sovereignty, we're going to have problems with a lot of Scripture. We're going to have problems with a lot of things that the Bible says because we're going to want to take the power and the control. Guys, I have to be okay with God being sovereign over all things, including myself. Because if I'm not, I'm going to question and I'm, I'm going to doubt and I'm going to fight against so many other principles of Scripture because I wanted to conform to my will. I wanted to conform to what I think. But God says, no, I have to be trusted in all things, right? I am the one who is sovereign and supreme over all of mankind. 
And so Paul is describing for us how that it is God's right to do that which he chooses uh, in our lives. Why? Because we are all under God's authority and God is just. The Oxford Dictionary defines just as behaving according to what is morally right and fair. And that's a, a really a pretty good dictionary definition. Behaving according to what is morally right and fair. That's God. He is morally right. He is the perfect standard. And he operates in 100% fairness. Okay? And God is perfect in him being just, in his justice of showing mercy and compassion on whomever he chooses as he knows what is right and he knows what is needed at all times. He knows what is necessary. And at times, what is needed to accomplish his purposes is to even harden the heart of man. And that's why we're given the example of Pharaoh. He's saying God is just even when it means he intercedes and he steps in and he does with mankind something that only he can do to harden his heart. And to say, I'm going to dictate your choices and your actions at this point in time, not you. So God can pull our own free will at any time he wants and do what he wants us to do. He can, and he does. All right? Do we get that? How can he do that? Because he's sovereign. Well, that's not fair. Then you've got a problem with God's sovereignty. You've got a problem with God's supremacy. Because it is fair. He is the creator. He knows what is best. He knows past, present, and future. He knows what we need. And therefore, he can step in and intercede at any point in time that he wants to. Because he is God. He is Lord over all mankind. Do we get that? We've got to get that. Because the rest of Scripture we're going to fight against if we don't get that big principle. God has the right to do with me whatever he so chooses. Okay? God has to be the final authority. That's the main idea of this series. Okay? That God is the final authority. But this series is entitled, Jesus Over All. So in what ways do we specifically see Jesus over all mankind? How is the Bible referencing this second person of the Godhead, the second person of the Trinity, being Jesus Christ? How is it referencing his power over mankind? I'm glad you asked. Okay? Look at the book of Philippians. We're going to look at a few verses of chapter 2 of the book of Philippians. And Philippians chapter 2 contains one of the most significant portions of doctrinal truth about, about the Lord Jesus Christ in all the entire Bible. Okay, so this portion of Philippians 2 is very, very rich doctrinally, okay, and it's important to understand what's happening here, because this is, is, is God come in the flesh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, limiting himself, emptying himself of certain divine attributes, yet still being God and taking upon himself human flesh. This passage is huge, okay, hugely important. Sometime toward the beginning of next year, it's my plan to do a series looking at the entirety of the book of Philippians. Uh, it's only four chapters long, but there's really so much crammed into those four chapters. It would take eight, maybe ten weeks to do that. Uh, but I really want to walk through the book of Philippians with you to be able to see the importance that is being placed upon Jesus. What is, what is the importance of this doctrinal truth among the rest of the book as well? But again, that's, that'll have to wait until next year. So let me go ahead and look at Philippians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 9 through 11. Okay? Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 9. The Bible says, Therefore God, and we're referencing God the Father, therefore God the Father also has highly exalted him. And that's referencing Jesus. God the Father has highly exalted Jesus Christ and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you notice anything there about God's relationship to all of mankind? He uses the term all and every. Okay? All of those are going to bow at the name of Jesus. Every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is one of those wow passages of Scripture. One of those things that you think one day, every one, every person, every man, every woman will bow before Jesus. The Bible says that every tongue will confess that Christ is Lord, and there is coming a time when every knee will bow before the Lord Jesus Christ, whether willfully in worship or whether reluctantly with a heart of defiance. Guys, as we said earlier, everyone will answer to God. 
even the most devout atheist who tries to live in his atheism and in his denial of God will one day bow before the God that he is trying to disprove and fight against. As the knee bows, it's either an acknowledgement of the authority of Christ or an acknowledgement that I, I was wrong. And it's still an acknowledgement of the authority of Christ. The word that we have in the New King James Version here for confess literally means in Greek to acknowledge, affirm, or agree with. There is coming a day when this statement that Jesus is over all will be acknowledged by every person who has ever lived. There will be an acknowledgement and an agreement that yes, Jesus is Lord over all from all of humanity one day. There is coming a day when that statement will be made. But here's the deal. Before that event happens at the end of time as we know it, okay, as far as our timeline, God wants for those who are his children, okay, those who have already placed their faith in Jesus Christ to point as many people to him as possible. That's why you're here. Okay. If you are a Christian, all right, if you have placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the purpose that you are still on this earth and not in heaven today is because God desires for us to point people to the saving truth of Jesus, to point people to the Savior. If we truly believe that Jesus has supremacy over all things, including us, most importantly us, as his child, if you're a Christian, we'd also better follow through with that belief by following what Jesus has said to do. It's not enough to say that Jesus has saved me, therefore I have a, I have a home in heaven when I die. What does God want me to do between now and then? Right? He has a purpose and a plan for all of us, for all of his children. Okay? The practical response that we should have as a follower of Christ and seeing the authority and the supremacy of Jesus is to do that which Christ has said and to live according to the way that he dictated to live. That is the practical outworkings for the Christian. Is God, because of what you have done and because of your power over my life, I will do what you have said to do. I will follow after your will and your way. Guys, that is, should be our response. Because of who you are, because of your position, because of your love, your mercy, and your grace that we've read about, I will follow you. Now, as I conclude this morning, I want to share with you something that I came across this week as I was preparing for this message. I was reading an article from the Gospel Coalition addressing Jesus' authority in our lives, and I read this quote from a man by the name of Samuel Zwimmer. Um, the quote was this. I'll go ahead and, and share the quote with you. The quote is this. He says, unless Jesus is Lord of all, he is not Lord at all. Okay. And that really, it just, it really hit me. It made a lot of sense, okay? Unless Jesus is Lord of all, unless I will willfully acknowledge that he is authoritative in all things in my life, in this world, he's not Lord at all. Okay? I've got to be at the point of acknowledging he has control over all things. Okay, now that in itself was a great quote. I mean, that one just stood out at me and says, man, that is so good. Okay, it just brings home in, in very, very concise wording this, this principle that I wanted to make. Okay, but I had never heard of Samuel Zwimmer. I'd never heard of this guy. And before I ever attribute, or before I ever give you a quote that's attributed to a certain person, I'd like to know where they came from, okay? I don't, I don't want to quote somebody who's a heretic. I don't want to quote somebody who, who later is going to go on and do things. People look him up and say, wow, Pastor Derek quoted this guy, and he's, he's really terrible, okay? And so I didn't, I didn't know who Samuel Zwimmer was, and so I looked up who he was. Um, Samuel Zwimmer was an American missionary to the Middle East uh, during the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, is really interesting because, again, I've never heard about this guy. Those of you guys that maybe have, have had more exposure to, to ministry uh, that's happening in the Middle East or that's happened historically uh, in that 1040 window, you may have heard of Samuel Zwimmer. I don't know. Uh, I had not. Um, you don't often hear about mission work in that area during that time period, late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, but there were missionaries. There was mission work that was going on. Um, Zwimmer spent nearly 40 years ministering in Basra, Bahrain, and Egypt. Okay? That was the area of the world where he was ministering. Uh, according to biographer Ruth, Zucker, or Ruth Tucker, Zwimmer's converts were probably less than a dozen during his nearly 40 years of service. So, wow. Okay? 40 years of service, probably less than 12 converts to Christ right? over in the Middle East. And according uh, to the biographer, she's going to go on to write several other things um, about Zwimmer, and I'm, I'm going to share with you here in just a second. But when she says that he probably had less than a dozen converts, to me, I'm thinking, wow, okay, 
so there's got to be more to this guy's story. Okay? So how and why did, did other Christians start writing about this man? Why is there a biography about him? Why are there quotes being attributed to him? Um, I mean, I understand the value of, of even just one person coming to Christ. Okay, but out of all of the missionaries and all of all of the people who've ever served, why would this man stand out from maybe some of the others? And here's why. Okay? First, Zwimmer started with the right basis. All right. This guy started with the right understanding of God and right understanding of himself, a right understanding of, of ministry. All right, he summed up his philosophy of missions this way. Zwimmer himself wrote, he actually wrote several books um, in, during this, his time period uh, in ministry. Zwimmer wrote this, he says, With God's sovereignty as basis, God's glory as goal, and God's will as motive, the missionary enterprise today can face the most difficult of all missionary tasks, the evangelization of the Muslim world. Great quote. I mean, that was his philosophy of ministry. So that is the lens by which he viewed everything that he did, okay? He says, God is sovereign. The goal is his glory, okay? And God's will is my motivation to serve him, okay? I, I can't think of a better philosophy of ministry, can you? God is sovereign. The goal is his glory. And his motivating factor is his will in my life. He says, and if, if we follow through with that, and if we bring that to practicality, he says, this goal can be accomplished, the evangelization of the Muslim world. And so he pursued ministry with that, with that in, in mind. And as a result of Zwimmer's pioneering work, four mission stations were established. And though only small in number, those converts to Christianity showed an unusual courage in professing their faith, and it became a generational ministry. The resulting church in Bahrain, uh, what's now known as the National Evangelical Church of Bahrain, continues to this day. So a church that Zwimmer had started, and I check out, you can actually go to their website. There's a lot of stuff that's in English, okay? The, the, evangelical, uh, the National Evangelical Church of Bahrain continues, okay? So the, there's still fruit that remains from that one particular plant. It's impossible to know exactly or even guess how many people were affected by the large volume of tracts and scripture that Zwimmer helped distribute. His books continue to make a significant difference today. His, scholarly, his quarterly journal that he started remains in publication as a significant scholarly journal. And through the work of the student volunteer movement with which Zwimmer was strongly connected and helped to initiate, 14,000 young people went out to the mission field. Wow, <laughs> 14,000 people surrendered to missions as a result of what he helped to, um, to bring into fruition. But perhaps his greatest contribution to missions was that of stirring Christians to the need for evangelism among Muslims. Wow. Huh? Samuel Zwimmer. Great example. I'd never heard of the guy. Great example of what it looks like to truly give one's self over to Christ. What can God do with an individual that says, God, use me for whatever you want. God, whatever you need to do in my life, I am willing to do it. You are sovereign over me. God, your power and authority, I acknowledge it. But he only saw 12 converts. Huh, no, that's not the only thing that he saw. And only eternity will tell the true impact that that one man made. Guys, even if you only leave one person to Jesus, that one person may affect thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of others. Guys, it doesn't matter the volume that you can count on your fingers of direct fruit. The Bible says that God is doing the harvesting. Our job is to plant the seed. Our job is to water the seed. And God brings forth the increase for his honor, for his glory. All we're told to do is be faithful. Be faithful to the God who has called us. Be faithful to the God who is sovereign over us and supreme in all things. Be faithful. And when we do that, Guys, God's blessings are upon our life, and it is the best life you would ever live. It's a much better version of your best life now than what you might find in the bookstore. Guys, your best life is obedience to Christ. Think about that quote one more time from Zimmer. Unless Jesus is Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Can you honestly say that Jesus is Lord over everything in your life? I hope you can. Guys, because that is the best way to live. That is the absolute place that you want to be. You want to strive to be there. To say, yes, God, I acknowledge your power and authority in everything. But if you're not there, okay, if you're not in that place and that point today, that can change. Guys, God can change that in you. He can transform a heart 
that is reluctant, a heart that is holding on to the past and say, no, go forward by faith and trust in me. God can change that in you because he is God. He is sovereign over all things. Let's go to him in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, God, that your love sent Jesus to this earth. God, I'm thankful that as we open up your word and we read from Philippians chapter 2, that there is going to come a day that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that, that Jesus Christ is Lord, that one day that, that as I am included in that group, God, that I will willfully bow before you and not be forced. God, that, I, God, that you have chosen me, that you have loved me enough, God, to call me out. And God, and by faith, Lord, that your grace has been bestowed upon my ha- behalf. God, that is something that I can never say thank you enough for. But God, in our lives, Lord, though our response of thankfulness, God, ultimately should be to point others to you. Lord, the example of this man that, God, that gave everything that he had to serve and to minister in the Middle East. God, he only saw 12 converts. That's the way that we think, only 12 people. But God, what you did through him and the the subsequent work that would take place and happen uh, through countless thousands of others, God, you're doing an amazing thing. God, help us to see that you understand the big picture. And because you are sovereign and you are supreme in all things, that you know what is best, what is necessary, what is needed. And God, that it is our job to simply respond and obey, to allow you to be Lord over all. So that in our lives, God, that we can see you working in the way that you so desire. God, I pray for those that are here this morning, God, and they're fighting with an understanding of what faith really is of what Christianity is and, and maybe what it really means to follow you with all of their heart. God, I pray that if there's somebody that's struggling today, God, that today that they would get that straight. God, that today that things would change. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be honest before you, that you would help us to be uh, just transparent in what we're thinking and what we're feeling. And God, the way that you are, are leading us through your spirit. God, help us not to be cold hearted and to be stubborn. But Lord, help us to yield ourselves to you, to love you well and to follow after what it is you call us to do. Lord, I'm thankful for who you are, for what you've done in my life. I'm thankful for what you're doing in your church. And God, I ask that we would follow you faithfully. And Lord, that you would help us to be the light in that darkness. I pray these things in Jesus Christ's name.